Hi, and welcome to the second session in our short and practical series on the kingdom of God. In our last session, we saw that the Old and New Testament speak of God's reign or kingdom in two basic ways. In a broad sense, God's reign as king over all creation extends from the beginning of history to the end of history. He always has and always will be absolutely sovereign over all. But in a narrow sense, the Old and New Testaments focus especially on how God's kingdom on earth develops throughout history. In fact, from the biblical point of view, the goal of history is for God's kingdom to spread step by step throughout all the earth so that through Christ, God's will is obeyed everywhere on earth as it is already obeyed in the royal court of heaven. The entire Bible holds together because it focuses on how God determined to reach the goal of spreading his kingdom to the ends of the earth. In this session, we're going to look at what the Bible teaches about the location or place of God's growing kingdom on earth during the earliest stages of world history, a period we often call the primeval history. Now that we've distinguished how the scriptures speak of the kingdom of God in both broad and narrow senses, we're in a position to explore how the Bible portrays the historical development of God's kingdom on earth. We'll start with the period of time often called the primeval history that covers the events described in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 11, verse 9. When modern evangelicals read the primeval history of Genesis, we're often preoccupied with what it says about the age of the earth, the origin of human life, and other contemporary scientific issues. These topics are important, but they easily draw our attention away from how these chapters first introduced ancient Israelites to the earliest stages of how the kingdom of God developed on earth. As we're about to see, the primeval history emphasized how God acted as king at this time, how he exerted his royal authority to create, to arrange, and to populate the visible world so that it would become the place where he would extend his sovereign rule from heaven. The primeval history it covers the history that we see from Genesis 1 to Genesis chapter 11 before its pre-Abrahamic history. So it covers uh, the origin of, of the world, like what we find in Genesis 1. It also covers even the creation of mankind, how mankind came into being in this world. It covers the Sabbath as well as the marriage, the institution of marriage, and God dealings with, uh, with his people before Abraham. So how God dealt with Noah and the flood. We'll explore how the primeval history introduces the developing kingdom or rule of God in Earth's history by touching on three issues. First, how this part of the Bible describes the Earth as the place of God's kingdom. Second, how it identifies the people for God's kingdom purposes. And third, how it depicts the early progress of God's kingdom during this period. Let's look first at Earth as the place of God's kingdom. The opening chapters of Genesis reveal that the earth was made to be the place of God's royal rule in many ways, but we'll focus on just two. First, we'll see how God's initial preparations of creation reflected his royal purposes for the earth. And second, we'll see how God set the stage for the ongoing expansion of his kingdom on earth. Let's begin by looking at God's initial preparations in his magnificent royal design of creation. To grasp what the primeval history has to say about God's initial preparations for his kingdom on earth, we have to set aside for the moment many of our modern questions. We first need to ask how ancient Israelites understood the story of Genesis in chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 3. It helps to know that throughout the ancient world, both divine and human kings were often honored as great architects and builders. 
Along these lines, a number of interpreters have shown that the creation story presents God as the true divine architect and builder who designed creation to be his massive royal palace. Every time the creation account refers to God saying, let this or that happen, it depicts God as directing the construction of the creation through royal edicts from his heavenly throne. In a similar way, parallel accounts in other ancient literature indicate that God's rest on the Sabbath day portrayed God as resting on his throne to receive honor for having successfully exerted his royal authority and power over creation. In these and other ways, the opening of the book of Genesis taught ancient Israelites how their God, the divine architect and builder, first extended his royal power from heaven into the visible world. The creation story begins with these familiar words in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. These opening words established the fact that God created two realms or levels, heaven above and the visible earth below. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 through chapter 2, verse 3, God began to construct the earth into a place for His glorious reign to extend from heaven to earth. We can divide this part of Genesis into three sections, starting with the initial chaos of the world. Listen to the way chapter 1, verse 2 describes the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. As we see here, at first the earth, or the creation below heaven, was without form and void, covered with darkness and the deep. At this point, the earth stood in sharp contrast with God's glorious heavenly throne room. As we've just seen, throughout the scriptures, heaven is filled with the blinding glory of God, but the earth was not at this time. The Hebrew terms translated here without form and void are used elsewhere in the Old Testament to refer to wild and desert places on the earth, places that are largely uninhabitable by human beings and the terms darkness and the deep have very negative connotations throughout the scriptures. But Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 tells us another essential fact about the opening of Earth's history. It says, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The God of light and life was not satisfied to leave the Earth in its initial chaotic condition. His Spirit began to move on the dark, lifeless world. The second major section of the creation account in Genesis chapter 1 is the six days of God's ordering of the world into a palatial edifice in verses 3 through 31. These six days exhibit a discernible pattern that displays God's unsurpassed architectural wisdom and power. In the first three days, God dealt with the fact that the world was formless. In the second three days, He dealt with the fact that the world was void or empty. God's actions in these two sets of days parallel each other in remarkable ways. In day one, God formed the day and restricted the darkness to the night. And correspondingly, in day four, He placed the sun, moon, and stars in the sky to maintain this order. In day two, God formed the atmosphere, separating the waters below from the waters above. Then in day five, God filled the space between the waters with birds and filled the waters below with sea creatures. On the third day, God restrained the waters below by forming lush, fertile land. And on the sixth day, God placed land animals and humanity on the dry land. God displayed incomparable royal wisdom and power as He arranged and populated the world. The third and closing section of the creation story depicts the Sabbath day in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. 
as in the previous verses, this account also highlights God as the royal architect and builder of creation. We read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Here, the picture is that God sat back on his throne in heaven, delighted in his accomplishments, and received honor for what he had done. His work was so magnificent that later in the Ten Commandments, God commanded Israel to commemorate his accomplishments every Sabbath day. In effect, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 3 tells us that for six days God issued royal decrees from his heavenly throne that turned the world from darkness and chaos into a magnificent royal edifice. And in the end, God received honor for what he had done as the royal architect and builder of creation. We've considered how God made initial preparations for the place of his kingdom purposes in the opening of Genesis. Now, we should turn to a special feature of this royal design that is often overlooked. God also revealed that he had ordained the ongoing expansion of his royal rule to the ends of the earth. Genesis chapter 1 verses 3 through 30 tells us six times that when God looked at his creation, he saw that it was good. And in verse 31, on the sixth day, he looked at his work and saw that all he had made was very good. The word translated good, tov in Hebrew, means here and in other places in the Old Testament, pleasant, pleasing, and even beautiful. When the Bible says that creation was good, it means that God approved of his work. But as we're about to see, what God had done was only the beginning of something much greater that was to occur on the earth. All too often, well-meaning Christians mistakenly believe that when God said his creation was very good, he meant that there was nothing left to be done or nothing to be improved. But this was not the case at all. After all, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God also said, it is not good that the man should be alone. The darkness, the chaos, and the deep that once engulfed the world had only been restricted. They had not been eliminated. God began by placing humanity in his sacred royal garden, but God also called Adam in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, to fill, to subdue, and to have dominion over the entire earth. Creation was very good at the end of the first primeval week, but only in the sense that everything was ready, ready to fulfill God's larger kingdom purposes for his creation. As we read in Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Think about it this way. In the opening chapters of Genesis, God shaped the world in the ways artists often make pencil sketches on their canvases prior to painting a full landscape. God established the basic order necessary for the world to become what he planned for it to be one day, but he didn't immediately paint the entire canvas of the world. Instead, in his inscrutable wisdom, God painted just one portion of the earth with magnificent colors. He adorned it as the centerpiece of the earth. This region of the earth was called Eden. Within Eden was a garden, a wondrously beautiful place, a magnificent sacred paradise fit for the special presence of the King of Heaven. It was so holy, so set apart from the rest of creation, that God walked there and displayed his visible glory. But as magnificent as the garden was, God's goal for history was not that the earth would stay in this condition. Rather, the entire earth was to become like the holy garden of Eden, so that one day his visible glory would fill the entire creation. 
the condition of the earth at the end of the first week was just the starting point for all that the Old Testament teaches about the developing historical kingdom of God.